Hey, 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 Closet Busters, come on and gather around. It's time once again to kick down those closet doors of life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, Bold Move Expert and Coming Out Coach, and I'm going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloseted. So come on, grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step in to living your truth as we explore more stories, tips, and tricks for living your life uncloseted. Now let's get to the show. All right, Closet Busters and Bold Move Makers, you know what this is. It is Life Uncloseted, where we say, screw it. I'm kicking down the closet doors of my life. I'm going to just set myself free, and I'm going to live my life without apologies, completely uncloseted. And um, today I'm really excited about this guest because... Sometimes, well, sometimes you just hit those shit storms of life and we all have them. They can't be avoided. You know that? And no matter how much we try, it just seems like everything's about to burst into flames, whether it's a career change, maybe it's a divorce, going through near bankruptcy, whatever it may be. There's just this emotional firewood that starts to burn and then we realize it's time to recover or maybe it's time for the opportunity. You're standing there and in the middle of a golf course in a thunderstorm, it hits you. (laughs) Nothing like tempting fate, you know, with a golf club in your hands in a thunderstorm, but it wakes you up. And that's exactly what happened to our guest today, Steve Gallen. He's a fellow National Speakers Association colleague of mine. And um, I'm excited for him to share his story because he has truly stepped into a space where he is making a name for himself as the motivational firewood guy and he's really bringing this to life and I can't wait for you to hear his story of how he uncloseted himself into living his life fully. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. So glad to have you here, man. Thank you, Rick. Pleasure to be here. Very, very honored. I I dig your podcast. Uh, I love what you're all about and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Me too. And those of you listening, you can probably already pick up that this guy has a history of being in this work. He's got that radio voice, that entertainment voice. <laughs> and it's so cool to hear some. And not that there's anything wrong with people who don't, but I, as soon as you start speaking, Steve, I'm like, okay, here we are. We got this thing going on. So, um, but let's kind of step back. You know, there was a whole nother life that most of us live, you know, before we come to these places in earth um, where you are today. But let's kind of go back to the the beginning of when things started to really shift for you. You used to be in the entertainment industry. You used to do morning show producing and all that sort of stuff. Um, kind of lead us up to that moment in the thunderstorm when everything changed. So sure. Take over in uh, the summer of 92, I was kind of following, which what was then my dream, went to broadcast school, got a job in radio in suburban Boston and enjoyed a 10 year radio career. Very successful, had a blast. Unfortunately, didn't take care of myself as far as sleep, diet, uh, stress, dealing with stress. And I just, it started to just become a powder keg. And at the end of 10 years, I was absolutely fried. Just, I'd worked 15 years worth of hours, put it that mm-hmm. way. And I was just exhausted. My marriage was crumbling because I just stopped communicating. Uh, mm-hmm. That's, you know, for my half of our issues. Yep. And I was just frustrated beyond belief. And then in a very short window of time, I said, look, I'm going to have a heart attack or a stroke if, I don't do anything about this. So I just literally slammed on the brakes, quit radio without another full-time job, which Mm -hmm. led coincidentally to the end of my first marriage shortly after. And I was $65,000 in debt at age 35. And I pretty much just crawled home to live with family. I just Mm -hmm. built the recording studio I'm sitting in right now uh, at my dad's home about 15 years ago. And one afternoon I was out with a couple of bucks in my pocket and I went to the golf driving range. I'm a horrible golfer. Mm. So I go way to the far end. So I don't hurt anybody uh-huh. uh, underneath power lines. And it was in August of 03 and a thunderstorm came ripping through and everybody else ran for their cars. And I'm just looking up thinking, go ahead and hit me. I don't even care. I wasn't mad at God. It was kind of like, uh, if you remember Forrest Gump, Lieutenant yep. Dan during the hurricane up in the crow's nest, you know, is this all you got? So I'm just sitting there hitting golf balls in a thunderstorm, barefoot in the wet grass, daring God to hit me. And I ran out of golf balls and I looked and two other guys that had run from the storm left theirs. So every ball was something I was mad at, frustrated at, mostly at myself. And at the end of it, my, I could barely even lift my arms. I think the last ball went like three feet and half of that was roll. Wow. And I got to my car and the sun came out and I just 
you know, one of those head shake, eye roll, look up and laugh going, all right, messing with me. Right. Well, the next day I was telling my brand, my then brand new life coach, I was his first client, mm. telling him this over the phone at our weekly call. And he's laughing hysterically on the other end. And he said, <laughs> I got two questions for you. One, are you this open and honest about your life, warts and all? Yes. Two, have you ever thought of becoming a stand-up comedian or a motivational speaker? And within six months, I was doing both. Wow. And did you ever question. see that in, did you ever see that in your future? I mean, when you, if you think back to radio days and everything, did that even cross your mind to be a motivational speaker or, or a comedian? Uh, comedian. Yeah. I'd always wanted to, but I never had the guts to even go to an open mic and get on stage. So it was one of those dreams that you don't tell anybody else about. Cause then yeah. they hold you accountable. As far as being a motivational speaker, not on stages, but at the time in the Tony, Tony Robbins had an online community forum. Yeah. I was the number one poster in the world. I was the most active member he had in the, on the planet mm -hmm. as far as being there supporting other people and giving ideas, even though my life just sucked at the time. <laughs> but and isn't that the way it usually is? Those <laughs> of us whose lives suck the most at the time, we're so good at giving everybody else advice, but we don't know how to take it in ourselves. Yeah, pretty much. I, th I think there's just, there's a lot of fear there. Absolutely. You, you, well, what if what if nobody cares, or what if it doesn't what if, what if it doesn't land, or what if I suck at this? Well, or you know, what I, if, I proved what if my first people see me for the fraud that I am, giving them all this great advice, and then they pull the curtains back and look at my own closet and look at what a mess this is? You know, that is the most vicious self talk, and I had it in both ears mm -hmm. for years. Yeah. Even in my early speaking days, I'm thinking, you know, the stuff I talked about was great, but, you know, people expect us to talk about money and riches and wealth and creating all that because that's success. Right. And I didn't have any of that. I had good advice, had great stories, right. but I didn't have that. And that was in the back of my head for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I also find that when we are the most open and vulnerable, which is when we really let the crap in our closets be seen, that's when people really get us. That's when people start to go, okay, I can relate to that. I can go do this. Yeah. And sometimes the stuff that we think, okay, we got to be able to do this. And I'm, I'm going through that right now because I'm kind of shifting gears with the podcast shifting and, you know, not turning my back on the LGBT community, but bringing it forward with this other stuff. It's like, are people really going to buy me? Are they really going to get this thing I'm doing? Yet when I just step back and go, but this is what you're supposed to do, man. So just go do it get over it. Yeah. This is how you're supposed to show up in the world. I remember the exact moment very early in my career when that moment of being vulnerable and just, just being 100% real. I was about 80% real at that time, you know, hiding behind some of the acronyms of the industry, you know, mm -hmm. rah, 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 buy my stuff and all that. I was at a speaking event and I literally forgot what I was supposed to say next. And mm -hmm. so I did the, the, the dramatic pause where I scanned from left to right slowly mm -hmm and right to left slowly and mm -hmm. said to myself, I still can't remember what the heck I was supposed to say next. And the audience is staring at me. I mean, they're leaning in forward in their chairs, waiting for what's next, thinking that this is planned. I spun a chair around, sat in it backwards with my arms folded on the top. I said, do you mind if I take a break for a moment and tell you why I became a speaker? And they thought it was part of the gig. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, yeah. And I told the story of a friend of mine who had Encouraged me to follow my dream of being in radio back in 92. Got my first radio job, and he died three weeks later. Mm. And I told this whole story about how when, when you don't believe in yourself and somebody else does, you need to listen to them. And I looked at the audience, and half of them are crying. Mm. And I said, we've got to be this real every time. But then I also learned, never leave an audience sad. <laughs> you know, you got to right. bring them out of that. Uh, which I do now, but that, that is still one of my centerpiece stories. And I, I, I'll never forget that moment. It was the most vulnerable, real, naked in front of a crowd I've, I've ever felt in my life. And it was a free event. I wasn't even getting paid for this one. But it changed the way I speak, and, and it will forever. But those moments, Steve, at least for me, and it sounds like you and I have had very similar experiences, those moments are when you realize, I'm here being who I'm meant to be in this moment for a purpose. That's yeah. what it is. I remember the very first time, probably well, it'll be almost two years ago. Yeah, yeah about two years ago. I, I, I speak on college campuses quite a bit, and I was in a human sexuality class, and I don't know why at that particular moment, and it was a very engaged class, so I think that was part of it. 
um, I finally revealed my own truth about early on sexual, I don't even want to call it sexual abuse, but that's what it would be. And um, I had never talked about it, never talked about it. But I remember as those words started to come out of my mouth, I was so comfortable with it. And I also told how that experience wasn't about what was wrong about it. It was what was right about it, that it was the first time I started to really understand, even at seven years old, oh, this is why I kind of feel what I feel. I don't excuse what the person did. I don't excuse it by any stretch of the imagination. But in that moment, I was so raw and real. And I remember walking out of that class, getting outside and literally shaking like a leaf because I'm like, I have never brought this up before. Never, ever. Wow. But then in that moment, it also gave me the strength to go, what else is in there, man? What else is in there that you can start to do that will inspire somebody? As I started to walk away from that classroom, this hand touched my back. And I thought it was my co-speakers because they, they'd never heard that story either. And I turned around and it was a young guy, probably 19, maybe 20, with tears streaming down his face. And he goes, I'm so glad you shared because I've been wanting to say something like that to someone and you're the guy I'm going to be able to share with what's happened to me. And that was the moment I'm like, this is why I was meant to say this. Yeah. And this is what I believe this whole coming out of our closets is all about. If you think you're the only one in that closet, whatever it is, trust us, trust me and Steve, there's tons of people out there in the very damn same closet you're in. Yep. So as you started to come through all this divorce and, you know, leaving your career and everything and stepping into this whole new endeavor of, you know, being on stage speaking and you're being a comedian, what kind of stuff started coming up for you? I mean, there had to be some excitement, but then I would guess like most of us humans, oh shit, am I going to be good enough? <laughs> that that actually you know it, it was part of it for a long time at first you know you and i see the same ads all the time you know yep. come to yep. our event and we'll teach you how yep. to be a twenty thousand dollar per event speaker so at first i admit i i stepped my toe right into the brown bucket of yep. saying the stuff that all the speakers are supposed to say mm -hmm. and got through that very quickly when i started actually mocking it you know, I would say, you know, team together, everyone achieves more and fear is false evidence appearing real. And people right. would roll their eyes and I'd, I'd say, yeah, right. So that's why exactly. I meant the only, uh, <clears throat> what is it now that with the letters that spell, I always forget the word, but I said, the only one I use now is Mosa Fogey. Many mm -hmm. other speakers are full of garbage indeed. Mm -hmm. And as the only one I use, and I've had so many people come up at the end and say, I thought you were going to be like those three speakers that were on before you. Mm -hmm. And I oh. take that as the ultimate compliment. But I also think that's when, when we get those compliments, it's also the validation of keep go doing what you're doing. You don't have to fit into the mold. And right, too many of exactly. us in life follow, go do this, be this way. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, this isn't talking about just speaking folks. We're talking about life in general, whether you're gay coming out of the closet, whether you're leaving a corporate job, the minute that people start to say, well, yeah, go do this this way and this will be success. And I'm not knocking those people out there who really do deliver some great tidbits on how to be a better speaker and how to go build your business. There's lots of great stuff out there, but there are those moments where you've got to go put the line in the sand, take your space that you were put on the planet to take up and do it your way. That's the bottom line. Yeah, you've and, and I've I've had newer speakers you know, once in a while. Maybe I've mentored them or met them through Toastmasters, and they'll say, "How did you break out of the mold of what everybody says you're supposed to be like, and just and become you?" And I say, "Well, it's it's a long process, but you have to be willing to let the world, like you said, see you naked to see yes. your real legitimate soul." And I say this very very often. Many people are walking out through the world every day praying for a hero. And a hero mm -hmm. to me is anybody who can leave a situation better than they found it just by being themselves, whether it's an encouraging word, uh, a handshake, a hug, a high five, a, a, a compliment, mm -hmm. just saying something nice to somebody from the heart, looking them dead in the eyes and telling them that there's something good about them 
And if they need a little help offering some legit advice with zero expectation of anything, just being a real human being with a room full of human beings. My favorite people at every event aren't the people, and I, as much as I love the people who sit in the front row and have heard my stories 10 times, and they clap, cheer, and laugh in all the right places, and I love them. Mm-hmm. The most important person in any room is the person who sat way in the back, probably came in late because he or she was crying in the car, not knowing if they could come in, never makes eye contact, never says a word, never raises their hands. That's who I have to work the hardest to help that day. You know, that's so interesting you bring it up because numerous times I've been, and a lot of my speaking career hasn't been on the big stages. It's actually been standing in small classrooms of 50 to 70, maybe every once in a while, 100 kids, but close enough that you are literally in contact with every person in that room. Yeah. And of course, you know, being classrooms the way they are, you're always going to have the one kid who has the questions or the acknowledgement that yes, I totally get it. But then there's those kids that you can just tell they're sitting there going, this guy is talking to me. Yeah. This guy is helping me see I need to do something. And those are the moments that you realize your raw naked truth is having huge impact and helping someone. And I, I wish if nothing else from the listeners who listen to this podcast, and especially today as we're talking about this being really naked and raw, and we're going to get into, you know, this whole motivational firewood brand of yours, but part of being that, that light, that igniter is realizing in your naked truth, if you only help one person, you've done what you were put here on the earth to do. That's my belief. Uh, oh, yeah. And I'm right there with you. I, I used to say, oh, I want to be up at these big events in front of 5,000 people. I've been up my, the biggest audience I've been in front of holding a microphone was 2,200 people. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, last Tuesday down near Boston, I spoke for 18 people who are among the staff at a senior living facility. And mm-hmm. I will take them over a big, cheering, raucous crowd mm-hmm. any day. It was one of the most intimate events I've ever done. And I'll, I'll take that every day because the feedback I got, even at the end while we shared a sandwich mm-hmm. was amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, and there are two different, obviously there are two different kinds of events. So you're going to be, no matter what kind of speaking you do or performing you do, you're going to try to do what you do. But I can tell you, I've done, you and I are about the same. I, my biggest event was 2,500 people. And at 2,500 high school students. So you know how hard that crowd was. Oh, yes. <clears throat> and <laughs> it was very hard to feel connected. But even out of that big crowd, I probably had between 20 and 30 students come up afterwards and just really dig. And I thought, you know what? That's my key when I'm in front of those big crowds is to know there's 30 people sitting out there that I'm really intimately touching. And what's been interesting for me is when I've done that, I find myself able to connect even deeper with the big crowds only because I see them as 30 people. I don't see them as this 2,500. I see them as 30 people that are really connecting with me. And it's been amazing to see how I'm able to step into that, but also not go, Oh my God, I can't do this with this big crowd. Now I'm the same with you. I would, I would take smaller crowds, but I also, there's a piece of the bigger crowd that kind of like, yeah, that's kind of fun. But I don't know, man, if I was like, here you go, you get this or this, I'd go for the smaller crowd just about every day, just because I love yeah. the intimacy. Yeah. Joe Calloway is, is a, a major speaker and author mm-hmm. from the Nashville area. And he's the one that, that one day I poured out, you know, I wanted to speak in front of 5,000 people. And he said, you know what, I've been there. And he's kind of the one that introduced it into my head and why. And I'm so thankful to Joe for that. And it's exactly what you just said. You know, you get that intimacy, you get to see that connection a little more readily than mm-hmm. a big arena gives you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but hearing from people afterward is, is always amazing when you find out. And it's not just, oh, hey, you were great. It was awesome. Can, you, can I buy your book? Right. It's, here's what you said. Here's what I went and did with it. And here's the result. And I had a guy run into me at a, a grocery store in the Captain Crunch aisle three years after he heard me speak. It was an unemployment networking group for the state of Massachusetts. Wow. And he, he walked past me and we're the only two in the aisle. And all of a sudden mm-hmm. I hear, Hey man, you're that speaker. 
And I turned around laughing. I look around, there's nobody else. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm a speaker. Where did you see me? And he said, Acton, Massachusetts, uh, huh. networking. And I said, when? He says, about three years. And I said, what wow. do you remember? And he quoted one of my stories and the visual I had used on the screen because I use a lot of visuals. Not a lot of words, a lot of visuals. And he said, I said, well, all right, here's the important part. What would you do with it? He said, my next job interview. I went in, didn't look at the floor, my shoes, the ceiling, or my resume. I had a direct conversation with the three-person panel, and I got the job. That's amazing. That, to me, that was the greatest high five of my speaking career Mm -hmm. three-year gap and he remembered and he took action that's the best part i mean we we can speak all day long but when we hear what someone did with it and the result they created and the confidence it gave them uh, it's better than a paycheck absolutely you know in this taking action piece that you just brought up it, it was similar to what i was just thinking as you were talking about this it's like it's that well it's in line with that bold move thing of my brand where if you don't take the action, then what's the point? Whether you're a speaker, whether you're coming to a job interview, whether you're coming home to the spouse going, okay, it's time to, we really need to have a conversation. It's these bold actions that move us all forward, get us moving out of these spaces that we tend to go hide and get us motivated. So that kind of brings me to the question. So how did this whole motivational firework brand of yours come into being? There's obviously a spark, no pun intended, yeah. <laughs> that really got this thing going for you. Yeah, and it's funny because at the time I was a member of NSA up here in New England uh, mm-hmm. until my, my schedule just wasn't allowing me to go to the meetings anymore. I was having a conversation with a gentleman named Don. He'd been around for a while in the NSA. And he said, well, who are you as a speaker? And I said, well, I want to do this, this, this. He goes, everybody says that. And finally, it got down to, I said, you know, I'm sick and tired of people just every month reading a new book and saying it's going to change their life or saying it's the one that's going to make the big difference. I said, we've all got a spark inside us. You just got to get the right message. You know, I said, it's like motivational firewood. I said, just you you stack it up. But when you add the spark, you can make a fire. Mm -hmm. And he just dropped his pen. He goes, here, write that down. Motivational firewood. He goes, you know anything about trademark? I'm thinking, no. He said, look up. He said, trademark that right now. Yeah. He said, that's, that's a concept that paints a picture for what sets you apart. And I open, actually, a lot of my events with that. I say, I'm the motivational firewood guy. And if that is confusing, let me tell you what it's all about. No speaker, book, DVD, nothing can change your life. But if you get this desire in your heart, you just go out and you find the right stuff that gets you to believe you can do it and shows you the way. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, if we, if you wake up the next day and think, speak, or act differently because of our time together, that's a massive win. So I'm, I'm curious, Steve, because you, you know, I love this concept, but let's just talk about somebody who really is struggling to stay motivated. They can't seem to get that spark. They can't even get that firewood stacked up. Mm-hmm. What, what, what would you, you know, what kind of advice would you give them? Because there, there are people, and I mean, I work, trust me, I work with clients all day long as a coach doing this, you know, where it's like, yeah, and I just can't get going. But I, I'd love to hear your perspective, given that this is your brand. So what would you give them, you know, as advice? A shovel. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, and I tell people that all the time. I, you know, they say, well, I, I don't know what I want. I'm like, okay, but we're barraged all day long uh-huh. with the media, with commercials of what we're supposed to want and what represents success, which, oh, does that drive me crazy? Yep. Um, I tell people, I said, look, you, I want you to turn off all things electronic and I want you to go somewhere quiet, somewhere that's relaxing for you. Get out of your house because there's too many distractions there. I said, I want you to take four things with you. Pen, paper, heart, and mind. Nothing electronic. You got to go put pen to paper and you sit and you think about every area of your life. And it's the areas we've seen in every life wheel model. Physical health, emotional well-being, spirituality, connection, family, relationships, money, career, all that. I said, start digging. Pick one at a time and write down everything that stinks about this in your life right now. Then write where you want it to be and then start thinking of the tiniest steps you'll have to take to get there. And I ask people all the time, who's ever set a goal that scared that crap out of you the next day when you realize you set it in front of other people because you don't know where you want to go or how to get there, but you, you say you want it. Well, let's start to figure out why you want it. Cause that's the most important question. Absolutely. We, we, you know, we see the experts all the time. They say, Hey, I have my success formula and it's a, a Lamborghini. 
And I, I saw a video the other day. It just made me want to puke. It's his 20-something drunk on his iPhone talking into the camera. Oh, my success. Mm -hmm. You know what? I don't want any of that. The reason I want to be successful is because I want to give away more of it. Mm -hmm. Giving is one of my my biggest things. Whenever I do pen, paper, heart, mind, it's how can I give more and affect Mm -hmm. more lives in a positive way? And believe me, I do this, uh, gosh, at least once a year if I'm feeling stuck. Mm -hmm. I go somewhere quiet. See, we have a seat coast about an hour away. Yeah. And I'll go sit at the beach and I'll just, I'll write for two hours that, and I'll rip everything down and then start connecting the dots to build it back up and get, just get rid of all the, the garbage and the noise is, yes. is the biggest thing. It is one of the most effective ways to get where you're going to go. We have, we have become such a society of in my hand, on my computer, you know, in my phone and I, and I'm guilty too. It's like, I, I remember yesterday I was going to run to the grocery store and I'm like, okay, well, let's just put the list in the phone. And then, of course, I'd already started a list, you know, on a piece of paper. I go to the <laughs> store, get everything on the phone, come home. And, of course, there's the one thing on the piece of paper. Oh, yeah. That, and I kept walking around the store going, I feel like there's something missing, but I guess this is what we have because this is what's in the phone, right? Yeah. And sure enough, I come home. But, you know, to make this connection even deeper, what I find when I sit and handwrite stuff, and it's proven. This is proven over and over and over again. This is why I have my clients do so many work, either journal or at least handwrite stuff out, is our retention factor is so much better and our ability to get to where we're trying to get to is phenomenal. And this is, this is <clears throat> why I love Simon Sinek's work so much because he goes with the start with the why stuff. And that's the important space. That's the place we're trying to get to in all this work. So, yeah. so I'm curious. I've been what? doing that for years. And then I listened to his audio book, The Starting With Why. And I thought, yeah. A, it validated what I've been doing, but it gave me even better insight Absolutely. As, to, as to why why is so important oh, uh, it's in that so journey. Important. And, yeah. You it's know, everything. I, <clears throat> so here's one of the most shocking questions and, and people who listen to the podcast you know, who've been with the podcast since it was the coming out lounge will remember me saying that this question is always comes up. But when I'm working with someone coming out of the closet, you know, the sexual orientation closet, mm-hmm. that is one of the first questions I ask them. Why is it important for you to come out of the closet? And there's wow. almost always dead silence on the other end yep. because that piece hasn't been explored. Now, not all of them, not all of my clients have gone silent. Some of them were like, because I know in order to be fulfilled, to feel at peace, to not feel like a fraud, to feel alive. Yes. That when, when they, when I start hearing those sort of things, I'm like, okay, this person has really been digging, you know? In fact, I remember one client said to me, it's important to me because I no want to, I no longer want to feel ashamed because I was sexually abused. Wow. And I thought, wow, this person has really done some of the work already. And it was amazing. So, so what keeps you, I'm going to go right into your, <laughs> into your brand. What keeps you so motivated to just keep going and doing? I'm, I'm really curious about that, Stu. Yeah. Early, early in my speaking, I had, I had a, a great friend. He was the executive director of, of BNI, which is Business Networking mm-hmm. International uh, here in New Hampshire, executive director. And he said, he goes, what do you do? I said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm becoming a motivational speaker. And he asked why? Because I want to help people. Why? Because people are in pain. Why? 17 whys later, mm-hmm. I literally had tears coming out of my eyes. And I told him the story for the first time ever about my friend Danny who had passed away, died of cancer. Three weeks after he saw me achieve the goal, he kicked my butt to go get. Mm. And I said, because someone believed in me when I didn't believe in myself and I want to be that person for others. Mm. And he says, don't ever forget that. Mm-hmm. And I, to this day, it's, that's, that story's been told in a couple of my uh, recorded pro, you know, programs and projects and stuff. And every time I talk about it, I relive it. And I remember mm-hmm. to never, ever, ever forget why I do this. It's not about applause. It's not about paychecks. It's that person. Mm-hmm. who doesn't believe in themselves. And if I can just get them to understand they have value, even a little bit more than they had when they walked in the door, that is absolutely why I do this, why I do these interviews, why I write articles, 
why I have a YouTube channel, why I, I have my own radio shows, every single bit of it. Why even at the grocery store, I will make someone laugh if they look like they're having a bad day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting that you said that because people ask me, okay, well, why do you do this? And my honest to God answer, bottom line, it isn't about coming out and being gay. It's literally about if I can help someone else be who they are without shame, then my life is fulfilled. Yeah. Doesn't matter if they want to be an entrepreneur. doesn't matter if they want to, you know, go tour the world when everybody else says you're crazy, you're going to leave it. If that's who they are and I want, they want to do this and they want to feel good about doing it. If that's what I help someone achieve by doing this work that I do by helping someone come out of whatever that life closet is, then I'm fulfilled. I'm happy. I'm at ease. I'm settled. All of that. And yeah. I think those are the important things. And as you're listening to this podcast and, and Steve's wisdom, I hope you really take in that this is about you being able to step into your truest self. Your motivational firewood is right there burning within you. You may not know that it's lit, but there's a little spark that's probably sitting there quietly trying to get started. But when you deny yourself that ability to step out of your closet to make your bold move, then you are keeping yourself held back from being the motivation you need to be for yourself. And I think that's kind of the gist of what you're all about, isn't it, Steve? Yeah, it is. Just just being that little voice even, mm -hmm. just saying, you got this, you got yeah. this, you got this. And so many people out there in our industry, they talk about balance between you know, like, oh, you be this person at work and you're this person at home. And I think that leaves a lot of people, you know, maybe justifying, well, I don't need to come out of whatever this situation is as long as I can be this person over here. And I prefer Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, his approach. It's not balance between, it's integration of. Yes. You know, you are you 24-7. Mm -hmm. Now, you, exp you may express yourself differently in yep. different areas of your life, but you're still you and your truths are still your truths. And there's only one truth. Uh -huh. you, you can't be these other things and be 100%. And since the day I heard in a success magazine CD interview when he said that, I said, all right, I am a speaker. I'm the motivational firewood guy 24-7. If I wake up at 2 in the morning and hop on Facebook, I'm that guy. Yes. Always, I am that guy. And it's, it's kept me on a much more positive path by not getting dragged down by drama and getting dragged in bad directions. Now, do I ever have bad days? Oh, yeah. I'm not mm. one of those speakers who says, every day above ground's a great day. Right, some days right. really suck. Yeah. <laughs> some days above ground really suck and you wish oh, you were yeah. in the ground, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, there have been days, believe yeah. me. But I just remember, I said, okay, how can I leave this situation better than I found it, but truly that it's going to make me better too. Yes. So that, you know, it's not just turning around and doing an act of kindness, you know, like we just had the big Powerball and mega millions jackpots, yep, like yep. A, over a billion dollars was given away in two days. Yep. And I see people on the news and the news crew and they're in line, you know, looking up, begging God for lottery, bribing God for lottery numbers. Because uh -huh. I see him interviewed. They're like, so what are you going to do if you win? I'm going to help the homeless. And I'm looking at the TV going, you're so full of crap. Mm -hmm. I saw this one guy who looks dead in the camera and he goes, hookers and cocaine. <laughs> and it was a young news reporter. And she goes, sir, we're live. <laughs> She turns at the camera and she goes, back to you, yeah. <laughs> and bailed. And I thought, you know what? That's the only honest person in the room. And, and I actually respect that guy. So mm -hmm. if you do an act of kindness, don't do it because you're expecting something or don't promise you're going to do something if this happens to you. Just be a giver anyway. Absolutely. And if you got no money, man, hold a door. And you might just find somebody who's given up on life that says, you know, thank you. You're the first person to actually care about me today. Mm -hmm. And I know that exists because I've heard that answer before Absolutely. and it made me want to cry. That's so cool. So speaking of things that make you want to cry, as we wind up here, one of the things I always ask every guest to do is leave one piece of wisdom that you have found in your own life that's really helped you make whatever bold moves you need to make or helped you come forward out of whatever that closet is you've been holding yourself back from. What is it you found that really works for you, Steve, to just keep yourself moving forward, making bold moves and living your life uncloseted? 
the one that actually wound up, it, it was an original quote and it wound up in my third book and somebody actually put it on the wall of their business. Just when you think you have nothing left to offer the world, smile. <clears throat> and the reason it hits me is because even on my worst days, you know, a speaking event didn't happen, something went wrong, whatever. If I went out and made someone else smile, I, I, when I got back in my car, I realized I was smiling too and not everything was all bad. And That's there's amazing. a reason that was the number one quote in the book out of 55 quotes. That was the first one for that. That's awesome. Reason. And it's free. And it's free. Yeah, exactly. If you allow it to be free, you know, I, I, I love that quote. And, um, I used it with a client. Uh, it's probably been a year ago. I brought it up and, um, I said, yeah, but you said it's free. I said, it is, but you have to be willing to give it away. And yeah. they're like, yeah, I don't know if I can smile. And that, would, that turned into like a whole session about why she couldn't smile, why she didn't feel free to give. Even her smiles went, ended up being a really, really beautiful experience. And as we all do, I, as the coach, even learned something from that. So, uh, so yeah. Steve, I just, I'm so glad we connected. Steve's got some great stuff. We're going to have his website, his Facebook, his YouTube channels, his Twitter. He's got uh, a beautiful vision board thing that he does that I think is amazing. It's called Engaging Your Why, Success, and Vision. That link's going to be on the show pages. So please, please, please just reach out to Steve. I love bringing people of his caliber and his warmth and heart to this podcast to share themselves. And um, just thanks for being here, man. It's great connecting with you. Absolutely. My pleasure. I am honored to be here. Like, like I said, I love doing these and, and mm -hmm. this was abs and I'll give you the ultimate compliment. This was absolutely effortless. This was two buddies hanging on the front porch, having a beer, just talking about what's really cool about life and, and what we see going on around us and getting to be a part of it. So yeah. I, I really appreciate being here. That's a great compliment. And that's, that's what I strive to do. This is just let's converse and figure out what it is we can give back to the world and help somebody, anybody out there who's listening. So um, thanks so much, buddy. And I hope to run into you real soon in that NSA event. Absolutely a pleasure. And I will be out there on the road somewhere. I'm sure we're going to run into each other. And that's it. That's a wrap. Another episode of Life Uncloseted has come to an end. But don't worry. We'll be back in just a couple of days with another episode with new guests, new tips, new tricks, new wisdom about how you can go live your life uncloseted. And you know what? A lot of people out there may not even know we exist. So if you feel so compelled, share us. Tell people about it. Give us a rating and review on iTunes. Share it from your phone wherever you can. Spread the word because the more people that we reach, the better the planet will be when everybody is living their life uncloseted. I'm Rick Clemens, the host of the show, that big, bold move expert and that guy that constantly wants to help people step out, step up, and step into living their life uncloseted. Have a great couple of days, everyone, and we will be right back with you very, very soon. Take care.